So we are in our new sermon series we started last week, Jesus Through the Eyes of Isaiah, or Isaiah is another way I've heard that pronounced. And last week the focus was on hope, this week the focus is on peace. And uh, there is, uh, so as we think about how we'll achieve peace on earth, there is an old story about how we will achieve peace on earth. I'm sure you all know where I'm going with this. I'm thinking, of course, of Superman 4, the quest for peace from 1987. <laughs> Cinematic classic, this movie. <laughs> Actually, fun fact, or not so fun fact, this movie uh, was responsible for a Hollywood studio going under. <laughs> so it didn't do so well. Props to Christopher Reeve, though, not only because he was awesome as Superman in, in those movies, um, portrayed that character super well, but also because Chris Reeve uh, did this movie for much lower pay than he normally would receive because he really wanted to spread a message of peace in, in the 80s at a time when everybody seemed to be really worried that there would be nuclear war between the U.S. and Russia and it would wipe everybody out, and so Chris Reeve wanted to do this movie, and so what we learned from this movie is that what we need for world peace is we need Superman, we need all the countries of the world apparently will agree to uh, get rid of their nuclear missiles at the same time. That seems super realistic. And uh, in the movie, they all send their nuclear missiles into space, and we also need apparently a giant net. This is literally what happens. Superman takes all the missiles in a giant net and throws it into the sun. <laughs> seems plausible. <laughs> uh. But in the end of the movie, what, he, uh, what Superman realizes is mankind needs to achieve peace on their own, and uh, he, meant to, he's, he talks about that in the UN. But the reality is, of course, and human history teaches us, we will never achieve peace on our own. Um, I mentioned last week about the UN. Uh, the UN has this mission, this is what they were started for, is to try and stop all war. Not so successful so far. And the situation in the Middle East going on in Israel right now is a, a sad and terrible reminder that mankind is not good at trying to achieve peace on our own. But peace will come one day, and we know who it's going to come through, and that is Jesus Christ. If you will turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9, we are going to see, again, Jesus through the eyes of Isaiah. And just a reminder, Isaiah is a prophet who was 700 years before Jesus. Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to read verses 1 to 7. So Isaiah is 700 years before, before Jesus. That means 2,700 years ago. And 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah is given these prophetic messages from God, and he shares them. We have them here uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We have them in our scripture. And um, he tells us many times through the, the book of Isaiah about the Savior, and we're going to see some of that here. So Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 7, and it says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You've enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the days, for as in the days of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire." For to us a child is born, for to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. May God bless the reading of his word. So we're going to focus on verses 6 and 7 there. I forgot to take this picture off the screen. This is not who the passage is talking about. Uh, this is the net, by the way, where they collect all the nuclear weapons. And this, again, the cinematic classic, 
nuclear man. This is the villain. His power is long fingernails and scratching Superman. Moving on. <laughs> I meant to mention that ahead of time. All right. Let me see here. Okay. So like I said, we're going to focus on verse 6 and 7. I'll talk a little bit about some of the other things here. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, it says. And uh, it's interesting to think about that phrasing. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. So there is a, uh, there's a thing in the, that happens in the scriptures where um, sometimes things have more than one meaning. And so if you re or to read that, for to us a child is born, for to us a son is given, it just sounds like it's a kind of a reiteration in the second line from the first line. To us a child is born, the second line sounds kind of the same, to us a son is given. But what we as Christians now, knowing who Jesus is, knowing that Jesus is the Son of God, we can see that there's more meaning than that, right? For to us a child is born, and to us... God's son is given. And Jesus is the only person, the only human being who ever existed before being born. Jesus is fully God and fully man. How that works is, to me, one of the greatest mysteries of the Bible. I cannot fully explain. And so, being fully God, Jesus existed before he was born. And then he was born here into earth and endured all the things that we endured and lived a life for us. And in case there's any doubt also that Jesus is fully God, we also see that in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 7.14 tells us he will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm tempted to go through some of the meanings of some of the names here, but uh, just a, a little idea of what's coming on Christmas Eve, December 24th. So just a reminder, we're not doing an evening service on Christmas Eve this year. It's going to be, since it's a Sunday, we're going to do the, just the Sunday morning service. And Dr. Dave Barker, my, my old mentor from seminary, is going to be coming to speak, and he's going to be talking about the, the names and the titles of Jesus that morning. So that's, again, he's my, my favorite preacher, so I highly encourage you to, to come to that and invite people to, to come up with that as well. But of the titles that we are given there, the one that I want to focus on is, he is called... Prince of Peace. And that is, again, a hard thing to imagine, right? That one day there will be no conflict. And it is you know, a reminder as well of the message that is so famous from Christmas time peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And if you remember, when the shepherds were out, with their flocks, an angel appeared, and then a whole heavenly host appeared, praising God. And they say, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And Jesus is, of course, a much greater fulfillment of that in many, many ways than anything else we can imagine. So something else to, uh, to know is that this is talking about a time that's to come. In the, in the book of Isaiah, he's talking about something that's made more clear in Revelation chapter 20, that there's going to be uh, a time to come, a millennial kingdom, a thousand-year reign of Christ. And so we won't get into the fancy theological term eschatology. It just means study of the end times. I won't get into that too much, but uh, I will tell you that to the best of my understanding, there will be a return of Christ, a thousand-year reign where the devil will be bound and Jesus will reign here on earth, and then there will be a final conflict with Satan, and then eternity with the Lord. And so what we're seeing here in the book of Isaiah is some of that millennial kingdom portion described. Um, last week, as I was talking about Isaiah, I gave you just a little glimpse of some of the history that we need to know to understand it. Let me explain it a little bit more for anyone who may not know. So we have the nation of, Eng uh, nation of England. Where did that come from my head? <laughs> not the nation, the nation of Israel, and uh, it had split in two. There was the southern kingdom was known as Judah, northern kingdom is known as Israel. Judah, by the way, uh, where we get the term Jews is from Judah, or Judaites, they were also referred to. And the other nation to know about at this time that's going to be significant to know is mostly off the screen here. You see a glimpse of it. This is the Assyrian Empire. And the reason you need to know that is because the Syrian Empire was the nation that was feared at that time. 
And it was, at this point, ruled by a man named Tiglath Pileser III. That means somebody was named that and then somehow decided he should name his son that and that guy decided he should name his son that because <laughs> the third. Anyways, that's another fun Bible name we need to bring back. Someone named their kid Tiglath. <laughs> anyway, so he is the ruler of this empire that is huge and it is frightening. And so what ends up happening is, I'm going through, a, through important history real, real quick here. So the, the king of Judah at this time is a man named Ahaz. And uh, if you guys remember that list of, of kings that I've shown of good kings and, and, and wicked kings in the northern and southern kingdoms, the southern kingdom had good and wicked kings. This is one of the very, very wicked kings. And, uh, but what ended up happening is, so Ahaz is the king down here. The king of Israel decided he needed to, you know, bulk up his defenses because he's got the Assyrian Empire above him. And so he makes alliances with the pagan nations around him. And God had told the, the people of Israel, so the people of the northern and southern kingdoms would have known this or should have known this. God had told them not to make alliances with the people around them. They were supposed to trust in him. And if they're faithful to him, God would defend them and give them victories, even against something as powerful as the Syrian Empire. King of the northern kingdom does not listen to that. He gathers together allies. And what ends up happening? Well, now the king, so they're afraid of Assyria, and so uh, they disobey God. They, they rely on other uh, hope instead of God. Well, now the king of Judah does the same thing. Now he thinks to, to himself, oh no, now the southern kingdom's got this big alliance. He doesn't want to join the alliance. Instead, he decides he needs to get an even bigger force to support him, and so he makes what he thinks will be an alliance to defend them with Assyria. Does not work out the way he hoped. Instead of help in defending him and his nation, they become what's called a vassal state. So essentially they're a puppet state of Assyria. And uh, a lot of suffering results from this, but there is a time where he thinks things are going well and the king Ahaz, he, uh, so the northern kingdom gets invaded by Assyria. That was in 721 BC. And so um, the king of the, the southern kingdom for a little while, he's very happy, you know, the, the threat to his nation he thinks is gone. He adopts the worship of the pagan nations. He even takes the altar of a false god and he puts it in the temple of God. He gets, takes the actual altar that's supposed to be God and he removes it, puts it somewhere else. And so this is a desecration of the temple, by the way. His son, thankfully, at least undoes some of the, the wickedness of King Ahaz. But this is some of the stuff that's going on here. And this is just the historical context that we should know about what's going on. By the way, in, uh, in verses 1 and 2, when it says, let me flip back there, when it says, uh, in, the, sorry, in the past he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will honor Galilee of the nations by way of the sea, Zebulun and Naphtali were completely decimated and their people, if they weren't killed, were carried away. Uh, and so that is what it's talking about, how they were humbled, but in the future, he will honor them. Galilee, of course, being where Jesus did a great deal of his ministry and, um, and grew up. And the Messiah, of course, going to be there is huge. But this is just some of the context to know about why Judah needed this message of hope why they were in darkness and they needed this great light that God provides. And so this is the message that we have about Jesus. And so Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. And I want to talk about three ways that we receive peace through Jesus Christ. And that is we receive peace with God. We receive the peace of God. I should have had the word the at the beginning there. The peace of God. And eventually we receive peace from God. And we're going to go through uh, a number of Bible passages. I put a couple on there, and then the rest will be from Isaiah. So if you like taking notes, um, I'll try to make sure I, the ones that aren't on the screen, that I emphasize them for you. But let's start with peace, the peace with God. We receive peace with God when we receive Jesus as our Savior. 
Let me read again. So this is Luke 2. This is the, the famous passage. This is the famous Christmas passage everybody's familiar with. Uh, and I'm going to read verses 13 and 14. So this is Jesus being born in Bethlehem, and the angel and then the whole heavenly host are speaking to the shepherds. Verse 13 and 14 say, Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Peace on whom his favor rests. That's important, right? How do we get into God's favor to receive that peace? We need to ask ourselves that. And first of all, we also need to appreciate peace with God, how amazing a gift that is, how amazing a thing that is to get through Jesus Christ. Because if you're like me and you grew up going to church and you grew up with Christianity, sometimes I think we start to, or if you've just been a Christian for a long time, sometimes I think we start to take it for granted we start to not appreciate it enough that the all-powerful, all-holy God wants to, have, wants to offer us salvation, wants to offer us peace with him through his son. Think about how often you sin. I'm going to venture a guess that we all sin one way or another every single day. And if you think that you don't, you have the sin of pride. <laughs> Think about, think about it like this. this is, I was thinking about this yesterday, what we could compare this to. I'm not going to name a world leader or anything, but imagine that you are going in front of one of the most powerful world leaders who has the ability, if he wants to, to have you instantly executed. This is more, I guess, in my head, relatable if we think back to, to, to when kings were more in authority than our democratic type of nations. But there are still nations where if you do the wrong thing, the leader can have you killed very quickly. Imagine that you were in front of the most powerful person here on this earth that you have ever met before. And he offers his hand, and you walk up, and you spit in his face. Why is that person going to accept you? How far is a human being who you insult like that going to go to have you in their good graces, especially if they could just have you killed? This is a tiny comparison of what we do with God every single day. Every single day when we sin, we are disrespecting the creator not only of us, but of the universe. The king of kings, lord of lords, every day we break his commands, every day we say, what I want to do is more important than what you told me to do. You gave me life, you give me breath, you offered your son for me to be saved, but what I want to do is more important, so I'm going to break your laws, I'm going to break commands, and I'm going to do what I want anyway. Now, we might not consciously, I hope we don't consciously think of it that way, but that's the reality of what we're doing. The Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why did we deserve that? We didn't. Why did he do that? Because God is loving, God is merciful, God has grace, he is grace-filled, he is graceful. Let me read to you Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to read that again. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That also makes me think of a famous passage I uh, you know, encourage you to memorize if you don't have, uh, Ephesians Chapter 2, 6 and 7, we have been saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. This is what God offers us. What do we bring to the table for salvation? I forget now who the quote comes from, but there's a great quote that says, the only role, the only thing we bring in, the only role we part, the only part we play in salvation is bringing the sin that made salvation necessary. That's it. And yet, we have, the peace, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. That is an incredible, incredible gift. Let's look at number two. Through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, we have the peace of God. I was um, 
oftentimes when I'm preparing my sermons, after I've done my research and I've written out notes and ideas and stuff, I'll listen to some sermons to make sure that there's not something important that I missed or, or misinterpreted something. And, um, and there was a pastor I was listening to this week, and he was talking about the peace of God, and he said, it's that ah feeling. <laughs> I kind of like that. Let me read to you Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. And the first of those two verses, everybody should be familiar with, because that was our memory verse this month. Everybody hopefully remembered at least that that's our memory verse. <laughs> Let me read to you Philippians 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends, is what the NIV says, or I like some of the other translations say, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So that's number two. We can have the peace of God. So what is that saying? As soon as you're saved, you'll never feel troubled or worry again. You're going to have peace all the time, and it's going to be great. <laughs> not exactly, no. But we can have the peace of God. Why do we not have that sometimes? Because we're focusing on the wrong things, right? There was a, uh, there was a psychologist that I uh, was listening to recently, and he said one of, the, one of the things that brings people into depression is if we focus on ourselves. He goes, if you focus on yourself all the time, that is going to be a, a pretty surefire path into going into depression. And I tend to agree, and I think the Bible highlights that as well. If you are filled with anxiety and worry, you're focusing on the wrong thing. What does it say to do there in Philippians 6? Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, what do we do? We bring, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So when you're feeling worry and when you're feeling anxiety, by the way, I was feeling a lot of that yesterday. I should have been listening to my own sermon ahead of time <laughs> and to that Bible passage. Bring your requests before God. And then what happens, verse 7 says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I remember a time when I was in high school, and probably most, if not all of you, will be able to relate. You know, when you're in high school and you're a teenager and your emotions are huge and you haven't gotten to that point yet where you know how to regulate them as well as, you, as adults can do most adults can do most times <laughs> and I, I don't remember uh, I remember in high school there was a number of times when I felt really depressed as teenagers are, tend to do and um, I don't and it's funny because at the time whatever it was must have felt like a huge deal because I left school and I was driving around town not sure what to do with myself and it's funny because it was such a big deal back then, and I can't even remember what it was, <laughs> which has been another thing that happens so often with our worries. But I ended up stopping somewhere at the end of a road. What do they call it when there's a circle at the end of a road? <coughs> cul-de-sac, thank you. I never remember the name for some reason. Stopped in a cul-de-sac and got out of my car, and I was just wandering around full of anxiety, feeling depressed. And then it was suddenly a peace came over me. And there, it, it had recent, recently rained. The, there was, the ground was dry except for a little puddle. And I don't know why, but I walked and I put my hands in this. It was a clean puddle, don't worry. I put my hands in this puddle and I just put them on my face. And I sat there and it was like God brought this peace over me and reminded me that he's with me. And I didn't have to worry about, again, I don't even know what it was. I, that might help my story if I did. But <laughs> God just brought this peace over me suddenly in a very powerful way. And you know, when you, when you hear these stories or when I've gone to visit people in the hospital who are dying, which is part of what a pastor does, is goes and visits people when they're, they're sick and things like that. And um, particularly when I was in Sarnia, uh, I was a pastor at a church with a lot of seniors. And when you go and visit people in the hospital who are sick, in pain, dying, and yet you see joy on their faces... Where does that come from? That is not just an earthly thing. That is the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Right? And it is an amazing thing. So we can have the peace of God. And then thirdly, we have peace from God. 
And the peace from God is something that he is eventually going to bring. And this is what we're going to look at a number of passages from the book of Isaiah about. So, Prince of Peace who is going to bring peace to the world, this is something that, God, that Jesus is going to bring eventually. So when our prayers are answered, by the way, remember Jesus taught us, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is going to happen in power. There will be peace on the earth. The whole world will experience peace. And, you know, I, uh, I have another couple of pictures here I wanted to share. So if you remember last week I shared there was uh, writing on a wall of Isaiah 2 verse 4. Um, and it is about the message of peace there. But what I did not realize at that time, I found out this week, is there's also a statue. Uh, oh, and it's about, I should specify, the passage uh, that is on the wall in the UN is about how swords will be beaten into plowshares because weapons of war won't be needed anymore. Right? So this is, uh, before we get to the picture of the UN statue, this is what plows would have looked like roughly back then. This is what the plowshare would have been, the metal at the end. So they will be, the, the Bible's talking about that weapons of war will be turned into things that are useful for things other than killing because war won't be needed anymore. Oh, where is my slide about the statue? Anyway, <laughs> in 1945, Russia, or the USSR, I should say, uh, gave this statue to the UN. It is, for some reason, this is the most buff guy you can imagine, and he's completely nude. I don't know why statues are always of naked people. But he's got a hammer, and he's hammering the end of a sword into a, a plowshare. And so it is, it is a message of peace, and it is the peace we have to look forward to. But it is not just war and violence of people that's going to end. The Bible says that the whole world is going to be at peace, even the animal kingdom. Let me read to you, again, for those of you who take notes, this is Isaiah 11, 6 to 8. Isaiah 11, 6 to 8. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. I'm going to read verse 7 in a second, but first of all, pause with that image in your mind. A child leading all these animals, including leopards and lions and wolves. I've always wanted to cuddle with a bear. They look so cuddleable. Cuddleable. But also, they would murder me. So, <laughs> And then verse uh, 7 and 8 goes, The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The, so let me stop for that one as well. It's hard to imagine that as well, right? Because we've never experienced something like that. There's some animals that you think should be carnivores, like if you think the panda bear eats bamboo or whatever, right? But most of them, if they've got teeth like a carnivore, they are going to kill like a carnivore. And then verse, uh, but one day that will end. And then verse 8, the infant will play near the cobra's den and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. I hate spi uh, spiders. I hate, I hate spiders too. I hate snakes. <laughs> If I were to say my one phobia, it is snakes. And that started, I didn't, until I was preparing the sermon, I didn't, couldn't think about when that had started. But when I was in my late teens, I was walking across a lawn and what I thought was a garden hose suddenly moved and slithered away. That's when my phobia of snakes started. <laughs> so it's nice to know that one day we won't have to fear them biting you and that a child, imagine that, a child can put its hand into a snake's nest or snake's den and not have to worry. Snakes are still gross. Don't do it anyways. But, the <laughs> but it can happen. So there will be peace in the, the animal kingdom will be tamed. The environment, the Bible says, is going to flourish. Isaiah 35, 1 to 2 and 5 to 7. I'll read those real quick. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it and the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool. The thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. So nature itself is going to, to flourish. 
Now, I know we think we don't need uh, the Lord for this because the carbon tax is going to make all this happen somehow, but <laughs> the Lord will bring a flourishing environment. Age and our health is going to flourish as well. Isaiah 65, 20 says, Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. So if you remember in the book of Genesis, it talks about Methuselah, who was a man who lived over a thousand years. And I take that literally, by the way. Before the flood of Noah, for some reason, human beings lived much longer than we do now. And in the millennial kingdom, those long ages will come back. And of course, and then ultimately in eternity, there will be no end to our lives. There will be eternity with the Lord. Our hope in Jesus is the only thing that can give us the lasting peace that I think we're all really longing for, right? All of us long for something that this world does not offer. And as the famous saying goes, that means we were not meant for this world. We're meant for something greater. And one day Jesus will bring that. Jesus' peace is something very particular. Ahaz, the king, was looking to anything else to give him the peace that he wanted. Anything else. People around the world are looking to anything else. They're looking for peace from money or peace from mindless entertainment or peace from status and power or peace from relationships. But none of that can give us a real lasting eternal peace. Even Superman, as I mentioned, can't bring us that peace that we want. The peace that Jesus offers is a reconciliation and peace with God. It's a peace we cannot earn. It is a peace that no one else can give us. And it is a peace that Ahaz could not find on earth. That is a peace we cannot find on our own. But we can have all of it through Jesus Christ. Peace with God, peace with life, peace even with death. And we can have our sin and shame and guilt removed. We can have all of that through Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you've done for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, while we were in the midst of rebellion and breaking your commandments and your laws and sinning against you every day, as we still do, Lord, still you love us. You reach down to us. We could never reach you, and so you reach out for us, even offering your son to pay for our sins, dying on the cross and rising again on the third day, Lord. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that he's the Prince of Peace. Lord, we thank you that we can have peace with you, peace in our hearts and our lives, Lord, and we look forward to the day when we will have your peace across all of existence, Lord, when there will be no more conflict and we can be in your presence. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you.